so much, everybody, for coming to our exhibit, um, War on the World. And um, we're just really impressed with the turnout here. This is amazing. <laughs> so thank you. Um, this uh, exhibition was uh, curated by Jan Berry, Walt Nygaard, Ron Erickson, and Tara Kraus, and hung by several of them, and Len as well. They did a fantastic job, and thanks to everybody who entered and was here. Lindsay was a fantastic help with all the uh, logistics as well. Um, but we have, we have a few other things to say first, and a special little something before we get to the artist talks. And so we are going to hand this over to our frontline studio manager and um, paper make an extraordinaire, Walt Nygaard, an artist. You do it all, Walt. So we're going to hand it over. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and you're on camera. Yeah, as Rachel said, thank you all for coming out here, and thank you, artists, for participating. Uh, we think we have a real strong show here. We enjoyed hanging it and kind of creating a narrative for you that hopefully people will pick up on. Before we get started talking about the exhibit per se and asking for responses from the artists themselves, we have a piece of unfinished business or some business. We would like to honor one of our members for steady steady <laughs> friendship, for being around when the chips are down, for good humoredness, for never complaining, and for giving us the gift or enhancing the gift of eccentricity in the art world. Uh, I think there's a couple of us who have stuff to say about Frank Wagner. We're honoring him today as the Frontline Arts Man of the Year. Yeah. <laughs> Frank has been with me when my car has been broken down, coming and going from Frontline Arts twice, and we had to be, be towed away. He was with Frank, he was with Jan Barry when his car was totaled coming home from Frontline Arts. So, art making can sometimes be a dangerous and dicey thing. And I have to tell you that my friend Frank Wagner, who's a gifted artist and a good humored guy, he's the man to have around when the chips are down. So I'd like to present this award to you. And, and Rachel, I think, don't you have something to say about Frank? I do. I have lots of things to say about Frank. <laughs> Aww. Frank, we also wanted to thank you so much for, for your generous donation for this exhibition and really helping to make this happen today. So we really appreciate it. And we love you, Frank. You're the man of the year. I love this organization. I love this organization. Yeah. I love it. Keeps me out of the pool hall. <laughs> and other places. <laughs> I've been busy on my patio. That's my next thing I want to get together. Yeah. We got to have a barbecue out there, maybe in December. <laughs> yeah, December barbecue. Sounds good. So, <laughs> Frank also teaches us how to do art. Mm -hmm. He's been doing this for years at the art group at Secaucus at the Vet Center. You want to know how to do watercolor? He can show you. You want to do acrylics? He can show you. You want to do all the other various aspects of artwork? He can show you. He can also fix your camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, thanks, Frank. I should, I should. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Aww. All right. Thanks, Frank. That's all yours. Mike Th made it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and, and just, I want to interrupt because Frank was a founding member of the Teaneck Peace Vigil. Yes. For 13 years, Wednesday after Wednesday, no matter what the weather, snow banks like this, Frank was there. Aww. Thank you, Frank.
Well, I'm gonna have to get back to the show. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there's this show. <laughs> Two years ago, we had a show in this room called The New Century of War. We had about 70 pieces of artwork. It was commemorating the 100th anniversary of U.S. entry into World War I. In my mind, the 20th century began in the year 1914, and it hasn't ended yet. That was the genesis for that particular exhibit. Last year, we had a, a larger exhibit at Puffin Cultural Forum in Teaneck, New Jersey, called Armistice Day 2018. Because as I'm sure you're all aware, the holiday that we so celebrate on November 11th, when it was first celebrated, was known as Armistice Day. It commemorated the end of that horrible war that ushered in the 20th century. In the 1950s, at a time of heightened reactionaryism, of the McCarthy hearings and the Korean War and the Red Scare, Congress, being the geniuses that they are, found the only, their only thing that they could do to correct things was dump the name Armistice and turn it into Veterans Day. Now, I grew up on Army posts. My father was a soldier for 26 years. I'm a Marine Corps veteran of the Vietnam War, and my son served in both Afghanistan and Iraq. I know all about veterans. And to me, the difference between armistice, when you ask people to lay down their guns and stop fighting, is way different from having a holiday that basically is open-ended in the creation of more and more veterans. That was the genesis for the second exhibit that we had last year. After that exhibit, we were standing around down in the print center, right downstairs, and uh, I was there, Ron was there, Jan was there, a bunch of us were there. And Tara Kraus, who's around here somewhere, said, well, what are we going to do next? That exhibit was great. And, and I'm thinking, oh, we're not going to do anything next. But it occurred to me that the one thing that everybody should know, that everybody should know, especially going into next year's elections, that the number one polluter of this planet, the number one generator of all of the problems that go along with climate change, is the U.S. military. And she said, great, that's it, that woman there. She said, that's, that's what we should do. So that's what we've tried to do. And we have the idea, and maybe this is just pure hubris, but we would like to replicate this again next year. So all you artists out there, keep that in mind. Uh, running into the, those, those elections, we would like to say this again and expand it and make it larger, maybe closer to a more populated area, much as I love this place. This print center saved my life. It changed my life when I came here in 2011 when, the, when combat paper workshops began. So I take this as seriously as I take life itself. But we have voices as artists, as American citizens, as veterans, as civilians, as people who have a story to tell. So I hope you pick up on what we're trying to do. And even if you don't, I hope you enjoy the exhibit. Um, I'd like to introduce my friend. It's an artist talk, so we'll call upon the individual artists to make a statement if they care to. But First of all, let's hear from Jan Barry. We have several themes going on here simultaneously, but a through theme starts over here with Agent Orange, which was manufactured in Newark, New Jersey, amongst other places. I put together an exhibit from a newspaper article I wrote in 2000 through the um, funeral information, the obituary for a fellow vet, Mike Eckstein, who died earlier this year 
from health problems from Agent Orange. And I tried to connect the dots on a map of New Jersey, how this, that, and the other thing is affected by just that one manufacturing site. And there are lots of other sites all across this country where that material was manufactured and then also used in various kinds of ways on military bases, national forests, etc. Um, and there is artwork surrounding that by Mike Eckstein, Jim Fallon, on that topic of Agent Orange. And then these little tiny pictures which Tara put together tell the story and it continues all the way around the room, kind of like a comic book connection. Um, and it weaves through all kinds of other causes of environmental problems. Look at those dead fish. Something really did those fish in. So some of the artwork takes a little while to look at it and think about it. Some of it jumps right out in your face. Wow. You know, some of these are very dramatic photographs in terms of something happened, explosive. And others, again, take a little bit of thought, like, well, what's wrong with this problem? There was a Nike missile base in New Jersey that used to be in that spot right there. Another Nike missile base used to be here, third one over there. All of northern New Jersey had Nike missile bases in the 50s and early 60s that would shoot down Soviet nuclear missiles over New York City. Wonderful combination. <laughs> Well, then when they uh, moved on from that program, all these sites were turned into something else. Was the contamination all of it removed? Who knows? Playgrounds. You know, playgrounds, like this one over here. Um, and so various pieces here are calling attention to various aspects of what may be hidden, that may be part of the military industrial complex, like coal. What does coal have to do with all this? powering the industrial factories that built the tanks and all the rest of it. Um, and some of the artwork is in different kinds of formats. Well, what's the one over here that's macrame well, let, or something? Let's let the artists talk about that. that. Okay. So it's a wide variety of materials that are used as well, which brings an enormous amount of creativity to the process of what we're doing. Thank you. I would invite any of the artists, and you can raise your hand if you would like to make a statement. And I've talked to some of you already. Joanne, who created these really tranquil, photo tranquil photographs, I think that you should say something about the where they came from, and you, sure. Um, first, I want to thank you so much for inviting, selecting my work for this show. Um, I've been working on this project photographing Nike missile bases with my husband over there, Michael McEwen, who's a sculptor and builds missiles um, <laughs> out of junk material uh, for about four or five months and um, I guess I was originally just shocked that these situations existed and indeed there's many sites called a ring of Saturn that circulates around the entire New York City area so they're all labeled with numbers you know like New York 57, New York 54 and depending on where we went, some of them were still, you can't, you can't go over here, you can't get on this land, and who are you? And then others were just sort of abandoned. So if you, you know, like this here uh, is Plainfield, and it's behind the school district. And it's just like, huh? And it's erased history. So I think that dichotomy between the subtlety of, of you know, dramatic and violent history that's not been recorded, documented the same way. Even people who've written books on this stuff, it's all been on the side. No, there's no real document. And then this here, underneath that, those tennis courts, were 12 nuclear warhead missiles ready to go in a moment's notice. And the same with the 
tranquil horse stables over there and summit exact same kind of location and i'll just like i guess conclude by talking just a second about how we had visited um the the nike missy museum well you know you might say hmm that's interesting well i was thinking you know like a real big museum is going to really be like it's down at uh, sandy hook it's open like uh twice a month for four months of the year and there's some old veterans in there. I don't know if anybody has been to visit, but I highly recommend it. The museum is barely hanging open. I mean, it is so funky and so old. And, uh, you know, and we had a, uh, one of the veterans took us around and, and just described everything. And then he described us this, one of the most, we asked, what was your most dangerous situation? He goes, well, um, we were, you know, just like a normal day. And then all of a sudden we got word that there was, you know, uh, a, Soviet planes coming in, and he's, you know, and it's a three-part radar system. So there's a radar that tracks missiles coming in, and this, you know, I might even get it wrong, so correct me if I do. But um, and then finally, the button gets pushed for the last, you know, the last radar, and then the missiles go up, and everybody's, you know, ready to go, and they've been practicing this forever and ever. And he, so this set of uh, Russian planes came in. And it turned out they had, you know, they were in the wrong airspace. Their, their radar had gone off. And luckily, there were planes sent out to find out where they were. But we, we were literally three seconds away from having this nuclear uh, explosion, you know, uh, right above our heads. I mean, this was in the 60s. I was like maybe in middle school by that point. And we weren't even doing the duck and cover at that moment. But um, it, it's very frightening. So um, in doing this project, to kind of conclude, I, I think that you know, the notion of finding old artifacts, uh, remembering them, and making them just really present, the subtlety, the secretness of what our government does, and all governments, and, and how we got to stay vigilant always and continue being aware of the fight and working as artists that way. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Ann, would you like to speak? This is Mary Ann Miller. First, I have to say, I think my nuclear phobia just came back, <laughs> which I actually had as a child. And until I was a, a sophomore in college, I was still afraid that any moment we could have a, a, an atomic bomb dropped on us. And I think it started with, in grade school with a duck and cover. And on my way home from school, I used to look for places where I could hide. And I finally decided, <laughs> against all rationality, that I could just snuggle up to the curb, and that would be enough to, to help me. I mean, it was a time of irrationality, but I never knew about that reality that you just described. Yeah, yeah. So we're still doing a project. Hmm. We even have a famous New Jersey mystery writer who wrote a book on it, one of those mystery books, or the Chris Foreman been trying to reach out the interesting did a whole thing on the Oh, I would I would love to dig into that a little bit. Um, and actually the topic of this show was a revelation to me because I didn't know that the military was this greatest polluter. I always thought the pollution that that came from the military were war machines left behind or munitions left behind, you know, the landmines and so on that gets so much publicity. And, and so it was really an education for me to uh, realize um, how really great the pollution is and how many different forms it is. I grew up in western Pennsylvania and there was coal everywhere. My family actually had coal mines. So we live with that kind of pollution. Um, but this is an entirely different, much more penetrating kind of thing. My, my piece over there is called um, 
Redemption Finds a Way to Leave the Earth. And that began as a poem. Um, but then it, it just moved into a, a visual piece. And I had the idea that uh, redemption just was so uncomfortable being here with us because there was no place for redemption. And so it had to leave. And so that's what that's about. It's a very dark, dark piece. And it's a layered piece. So there's, there's layered thinking there. And um, the uh, other piece is actually prompted by a, um, by a prompt that Walt sent around about um, sonar in the oceans. Uh, caught, this is called toxic sonar. And um, with the um, creatures in the ocean that are affected by this sonar, and the ones that are, are, that are mammals, of course, they have to come up and breathe, and they're disoriented. Some of them beach themselves, but how many of them can't do that? And we don't know how many went too deep, and they're, that's how they were lost. And so um, they are our fellow creatures. And so there's a, uh, whoops, there's a human face behind here, if you can see that, which um, on the monoprint part of this piece, um, which was a total um, accident, which happens with monotypes so often. And when you uh, pair with this randomness, these things happen. So I, I had to use this yellow, this yellow crime scene color because the ocean is a crime scene. And I love seeing the reference to that over here in another piece uh, where it said uh, crime scene. Um, I'll have to find it again. And so I use, I use a lot of things in my studio that would be considered um, uh, detritus. And um, like the, the tarlatan that is just soaked with ink and so on. So I decided to, to use that stuff and have, it was kind of a chaotic process. And I was feeling very chaotic and trying to organize a composition out of these chaotic pieces became the challenge. So I really am happy for the opportunity um, that these pieces are shown and that um, I was caused to think more deeply about this topic. So thank you, Walt and Jan. Thank you. And you. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. That was incredible. <laughs> All right. Jim. Okay. This is uh, my friend Jim Fallon. Look you up here. Sure. <laughs> uh, I have a few pieces over there, <clears throat> which, along with Frank, I am a victim of Agent Orange. I have a titanium bone from here to there. I had bone cancer, and luckily, they took the bone out, and that's, uh, that was the end of it. For me. So uh, luckily, I'm, I'm a survivor. Uh, I was a medic in Vietnam, and I saw, I have a few pictures over there of some of the things I really saw with <clears throat> helicopters spraying over us. And, yeah, and what people don't understand is it wasn't the VC or the NVA doing this to us. It was us doing it to us. And that's the part that really gets you. Uh, my cancer didn't show up for 25 years after I came home. Uh, Frank is also a victim and Mike and there's just thousands and thousands that are affected by this every year. And uh, it, just, it just never ends. So uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the show. If you can. <laughs> you got it? Just to briefly amplify on what Jim was saying, that barrel of uh, Agent Orange was created by a guy named Mike Eckstein, who was a friend of ours and who died this summer. Uh, he'd survived a back operation and was doing fine and had a heart attack and died. And he had struggled with uh, physical problems related to Agent Orange, as had his children and his grandchildren. And like in Vietnam today, where there's this huge population of 
disfigured, crippled, mentally impaired children and grandchildren of the Vietnamese soldiers and civilians who fought us back in the 60s and 70s. It's, it's a problem that is just as alive today, if not more so, than it was then. Sue, would you like to say something? Sure. This is Sue Ahn. She's a concert violinist. Her dad is a Viet survivor of the Vietnam War. Hi, um, my name is Sue. This is my first art show, so this is really exciting for me. Um, my piece is Sergeant Bob over there. It's the gas mask. Uh, so it's just a little bit about it. Uh, my medium is something called paper quilling. It's just very, very fine pieces of paper that can be shaped and molded and glued into different shapes. Um, the eyes are actually burnt newspaper articles about building luxury high-rises because that's what we need more in this world, apparently. Uh, the bow tie, I thought, it, it symbolized a lot of things. So the bow tie is a recycled uh, grocery bag from Wegmans. You know, the, the background, I love the texture of the combat paper. And, you know, that represents a uniform. And I added the bow tie because I wanted to really bring something together that it's almost like a facade. You know, what, what we do and what we represent in the military world in a way. It's kind of a facade. We put a little bow tie on it. We make it look neat. But there is a lot of history and stories underneath that. So that was my little piece. Wow. Here you go. Thanks. Tara, I think that you should definitely say something about your artwork. Tara Kraus. <laughs> I want to thank, um, well, I want to thank Frontline, and I want to thank this extended community. I want, I want to thank the um, Frontline paper crew um, and their patience as well as the support, because some of these were still wet when I was bringing up them up the <laughs> stairs. Um, and, and I knew 39 prints. It wasn't really right for me to ask for them to be included. Um, but I was really touched when you guys just like said, yeah, um, let's do it together. And Jan came up with the way they hung them. And Ron, as usual, hung them with great grace and beauty. Um, this, was, um, this was a difficult project. Um, I've, been, I've been looking at how do we use um, the uh, traditional engraving on um, line of cut to tell stories, um, really powered by what's going on in Oaxaca with the printmakers, as well as then Renaissance um, engravers. So how do we tell these stories? How do we tell these stories so we aren't hopeless? And, and for me, a great learning came out of it. Um, I was going to make a pop-up out of these. Um, and they still will, but we ran out of time. But part of it was because I chose to um, take it, take the preparation as an investigative journalist and as a human rights advocate. Um, and so that meant consuming everything that had been written, the court documents, the marine biology studies of the currents, um, in fact, one of the things that actually made was the poetic tragedy of blue crabs on the Passaic and how people in Harrison and Newark and Kearney were catching them, these dioxin ones, and they'd actually begin migrating. And then around um, oh, Raritan Bay, the lobsters start eating them. And then on the other side of Sandy Hook, which you'll see in the litany against Agent Orange, that's Sandy Hook, right off of there is a dump site called HARS. Uh, I'm not sure what the anacronym is, but harm is definitely part of it. 
where they took sludge with dioxin and dumped it out there. Um, I've lived on the New York Bight because this is ultimately a love song to the New York Bight. And, and I wrestle with, okay, when we're doing things on endless war, when we're doing hell, ecocide was a term invented by the producer of Agent Orange. The initial chemist that worked on that um, was horrified at that it was being manufactured. And in about 70s, at one of the Vietnam veterans tribunals, um, brought up the term ecocide. Um, it's dark, and we all know it's a challenging time. So do we become hopeless? And, and this is where I, I mean, where I kind of culture jam with pop-ups, you know, on the light and on the side. Um, and I don't do it lightly. I do it because it's dark. It's kind of like, we know we're going to drown, so let's together learn survival swimming. Um, so, so what it came out as, as I started wailing away after ingesting all this information and said, okay, you know, that, that's what we did in the 90s with human rights tribunals, whether it was in um, New York or in Istanbul when we had um, Kurdish activists and community members, when we had pavement dwelling um, women from Mumbai and their human rights advocates. Uh, the Ogoni people um, and Shell Oil, as well as the Danette people, um, Black Mesa. And we'd bring them together and they would tell their stories. And human rights advocates would come with the regime of international law and break that down, but it was the stories. And that's what this came out. I was surprised. I started with the, all these pictures are based upon actual archive photos, except for the VA shot. I shot that on the fly because I wanted to show the vertigo we all experience going into the VA. Um, <laughs> and my four amigos, my blessed companions of um, crew members of Frontline uh, Paper. But it started with the um, Vietnam Vets for Peace, or excuse me, uh, vet, uh, Veterans for Peace, um, Veterans, Vietnam Veterans against, against, against the war. Thank you. And these archives, the archives of people marching, the archives of just showing a guy doing his laundry inside one of the um, Agent Orange barrels. Um, you know, to the beginning of the surviving Agent Orange, and what does it mean surviving, um, and fighting for the VA recognition. Um, but still hasn't, you know, completely done it. We have people dying still, veterans dying still, and the VA is not recognizing that as uh, service connected. Um, and then, so then we end up in the VA with our cocktail of meds to numb, manage whatever we're doing, whether it's the bent brain alchemy of PTSD or whether it's the cancers or whether it's the toxins we all carry from war within us, both those that go and fight and those that are fight, fought upon, you know, those communities that bear the carnage um, and down to the DNA. Uh, because this was then the section that was the most difficult for me to do because it took about two weeks and I was wailing away, hoping to carve with honor, you know, carve people um, who I didn't have a right as a white woman to just hold up, um, you know, for that. But how could I, with dignity and honor, um, raise their stories? It's not a story for me to share. There's a, I mean, there's a dance there um, when we get to it. Uh, that's important and ethical. We had some ethical discussions, you know, what can I do? Um, so then we start looking at, and we have widows. Again, these were from the protests. These are from the, um, the children of who's? Um, Heather? Yeah, Heather, thank you. Um, Heather and the children of the Vietnam vets, you know, where we're beginning with second generation and third generation defects. Um, and the love, 
the love. I mean, I, I wanted to show the love on all sides. Uh, we have three generations of poisoning. And, and while this is Agent Orange in Vietnam, then into um, Ironbound, what did we leave behind? You know, they talk about five, uh, half million dead or maybe two million Vietnamese um, still affected by dioxin in the, in the ground, in the food sources, in the water tables. Um, and so these, and that's a Vietnamese sign that doesn't say don't catch the crabs the way we have it multilingual in, um, on the Passaic River, but that is the danger. You know, this is more than scorched earth because scorched earth, we hope, grows back. Um, this is poisoned earth. Um, and so then I looked at a French um, photojournalist went to, went into a hospital in Vietnam for the children of, and the grandchildren of Vietnam veterans. And with the stillbirths, um, with the different um, defects and to how to care for them with dignity, and then how also to share the story. Um, and then one of the, the picture of the Vietnamese woman breastfeeding, this came from a, a Vietnam combat artist. And I thought it was fascinating because in combat art, I've never seen a breastfeeding woman. Um, but then the horror of it is, what is she passing on? What is he or she ingesting? And what do they? And then when you look at the picture in the far corner, um, this girl is third generational, um, you know, with defects. And I want to keep our minds of that these defects are happening as we speak, because they're happening also in Ironbound and Harrison and Newark. Um, because without cleanup, or even through cleanup, we still have uh, twice a day on a tidal basis, we have the spreading of the con contaminated soils. So as that was a story, and there I was with, you know, trying to hold in the darkness of it, of war. And then beginning to find out about the corporate greed and the malfeasance that they they had several um, uh, shamrock had several um, spills that they denied. They used to have guys rake up the toxin um, off the uh, low tide line so people wouldn't know. They had buzzers rigged for when inspectors. In fact, I just learned this week, Yoakum. Oh dear, Chuck Yoakum, who was a spokesman for Diamond, Sh Diamond Shamrock, um, completely categorically denied that they didn't know anything about dioxin. Meanwhile, there had been corporate memos that said, destroy all records. They put it on paper. Um, OK, so I, let me speed up, because I know people are getting restive on their feet. But then I wanted to shift it. OK. If this truly is something that we can talk about, something we could be hopeful that we could address, let's go back to New York Bite. Let's look at not just the damage um, and the linkages between food groups and where we're only supposed to have once a year or never blue crab or you know lobster once a month, um, that we begin to look at the the site, 80 Lister Avenue. This is a super fun site. The Passaic is a super fun site. The first river to be declared a super fun site. And you have the incinerator down the hall. So all of a sudden, we're beginning to talk about eco-justice. You know, what's the community that lives in Iron Bond? Well, as one would almost be able to bet on it, you have between the high figures on the poverty rate poverty rate are 10 percent. The mean is about 30 to pockets of 40 percent. You have a majority of um, oh, immigrants, you know, of uh, Latino, Latinx, and um, European immigrants there. And it's a 25 percent asthma rate, as well as then they're beginning to see third generation birth defects. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the story. All of a sudden, in 1983, uh, you know, for years, people were getting, the, what do they call it, the chloracne, you know, showing visible dioxin, the workers, dioxin um, oh, uh, effects of the poisoning. But if you look at, you know, this, I'm not sure whether you can see it clearly, but this was where they were dumping it full scale into, into the Passaic. Guys in hazmat suits actually went and took women's, because there's a, Terrell Homes was the public housing that was a couple of blocks away. They took the um, vacuum cleaner bags from women, you know, to during the thing, and completely denying it, the governor came down. Well, since that time, now granted, they're still finding barrels, um, least in Harrison, um, is we now know, don't eat the crabs. We put up government signs that say three different la languages, English, Spanish, and Portuguese, they'll cause cancer. Um, and so then, and this to me was the major learning. This to me is the gift of our craft of storytelling and our ability to serve eco-justice and human rights and to tell our stories and help other people tell theirs um, was the archives of the Ironbound com uh, Community Corporation. And in them, from the 80s, they had all these pictures of the children protesting. These are actual pictures from their archives, you know, of kids, kids that would play on the barrels of Agent Orange, because um, that's the only playgrounds that they had. Um, you had citizen science of girls, about Girl Scout age, probably their science teacher took them down to the Superfund site. Of course, people still, to this day, are catching crabs. It's a protein source. Um, despite all the warnings, and in fact, there's an interesting study right now, um, NYU uh, Environmental Medicine is actually working with the community to understand why people are still catching it. You know, do they understand, can, can incentives, they actually have a tilapia switch out. Um, you know, that if someone brings a blue crab or brings a, a blue crab, a striped bass, Manhattan, um, an eel and bluefish, they'll get a tilapia. Um, and and I'm, making, I'm making jests with it, but well, we have to, we have to. Um, and so I, I found all these pictures of these children. You know, you talk about don't make us the gu guinea pigs when you had all sorts of studies, medical studies, um, well, of course, the economic studies, um, the scientific studies looking about the impact. And to me, the, per, uh, forgive my Spanish, the derecho de sabir, sabir? Um, the right to know. It's like the women in Bhopal <coughs> held up, um, oh, held up jars of their urine, test this. Um, and this was in the, 80s, and this is children doing it. To me, they're heroes. You know, we in the military or the veterans, these were traits we were supposed to live up to. You know, and here they are in action. Um, and I just think that's a really interesting, who are the heroes here? Those ones in the arena. And as we see, it's the children. Um, Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, I didn't put the line there because I didn't want anybody to think I was being political. Um, but it was the biggest crime scene in New Jersey, that's what he said, um, the Passaic site. Um, and, and with this one, this, this was a kid flying a kite at the new River, Riverbank Park in Newark. And that, that's a joyful, you know, it looked like a beautiful spring you know, morning with a kid flying, actually running down along this toxic stretch of land that's been reclaimed. And in my mind, it was either a kite with joy or else it was a white flag. And that's kind of 
what is it? Do we just, as, as these beautiful, um, the necklace of, um, oh, the batteries, you know, the anti, the anti um, missile, the ADA batteries, you know, do we, do we lose that and just build condominiums on top of it? Or do we actually active, um, oh, uh, remediate the last, whoops, sorry. And I, I thank you for your patience to try to string together all the strands of this, is this was, and I'm not gonna call it defense and industry anymore. I'm not doing it. Not with when we find endless war is a major driver of climate change. I'm gonna call it, it's a war industry strategy. You know, endless war is great for profits. You sum up the, you sum the, uh, environmental costs and the social costs to zero, and you got profits. Um, so, and, and to get this strategy, it's a profit strategy, it's brilliant in terms of corporate strategy. You get fraud, destroy the records, deny, fight for 20, 30 years in court against your responsibility, polluter pays. Actually start out, they pioneered, <laughs> Investment bankers worked with them and they pioneered so now that they have a corporate shell that's just funded for lawyers to fight liability. And so part of the triangle is fraud. The next is eco-racism. Would they have put this in Rumson? Would they have put this in, um, name another, uh, Hoboken has some, but let's say right yeah, where sure. the big condos are. Um, would they have done this? No. PPEC. Thank you. Would they have done this in PPEC? No. Um, so where do you go? You go where you know nobody has advocates. You go where nobody has lobbyists. You go where people's votes don't even come into um, consideration. And you know that they're going to die on their own. Um, and that to me, I lived in Harrison. I would walk. My, my kids played on the Peruvian soccer team. You know, we, we did, this was a community. Um, and so, and, and then the third tier is ecocide. We don't care. This is our right. It is our national security. We are the war industry. Um, and then lastly, the idea of eco-justice communities of color. Um, boy, this is, how can we as frontline artists serve this in New Jersey in the hyper-local fight against whether it's incinerators or pipelines or just this? Um, how do we use our, our skills? Is it through art builds? Is it just telling stories that we find out about? Or is it actually partnering like Jan was part of a discussion in Ramapo mm -hmm. where they brought um, artists in. Um, so I've talked an awful lot, and I thank you. I, I, I thank you for giving this chance to see, damn, we can do narrative. We can do tears and, and gnashing of teeth and gnarls and anger, but at the end, hope, because this is all we got. And our hands are all we got. So I thank you. Okay, when I when I look at this exhibit and the work that we've done, I think of it in sort of simpler terms. <clears throat> all of what Tara said is right on the spot but for us we're artists we have voices we have something to say we we have the information so we did this exhibit next year we want to try to do it even better so all of you artists out there keep that in mind will it change the world will it affect everybody will people get the message i don't know but we're artists and we can do this so let's do it um the last artist that we have time for, so to speak, is Len Merlo. And I want to drag him up yeah, here. Sorry, 
I'm not going to try to fo follow um, Tara's uh, no, please, speech. Man. You um, need me. All I want to say is I, I agree and I understand exactly what you said, and I think we're all coming from the same place. Um, I grew up in Cancer Alley, right like six blocks from exit 13 on the turnpike. So I know the story of pollution. Um, during the Soviet era or the, during the Cold War, I knew that the Exxon refinery would be one of the first targets. So our philosophy and our family was, we're just gonna walk out the front door and go from there. Cause the you not survived in whatever, you know, the plan was as far as the nuclear holocaust. But um, I spent my whole life fighting for social justice and environmental issues. And my pieces sort of reflect that. Um, I know I don't have a big enough platform to go on TV or to be a politician. So I use my work to express um, the feelings I have and what I want to say. Um, and I want to just Mike and I, Mike Stark, some of you know our studio manager, him and I co uh, um, cooperated on m making this edition as a giveaway. This came from an old um, button from the 60s, which was an environmental around, the, around 69, 70 for the first Earth Day. And it was basically love your mother. So these are just a handout for everyone here. Um, we want to give these away. We want you to keep in mind everything that was said here today because it's important. You know, we are in a war. We're in a war for our lives and our children and our grandchildren. So these are available and, and that's, I'm going to keep it short, but that's all I wanted to say. And I just want to give one of these, you know, to everyone take as many as you like until they run out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, we have one more speaker. Yes. Her name is Pat Beanie Morell. Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta clip you in. You're gonna clip me in. Yes. Okay, uh, just to really sort of add emphasis to everything that has been said here today, uh, I should say, first of all, that my association here also comes to printmaking council. I started out with the people who founded Printmaking Council, and it is nice to see it go forward with an emphasis on handmade paper uh, and this sort of thing, which was very much a part of what they were interested in, along with printmaking. Um, as far as veterans go, I should say my mother served in the First World War as a man, uh, person, the National Yeoman F down in Rotten, Connecticut, to keep the Nazi spies from coming up the river. And then there, of course, just all the cousins who went through Korea and uh, the Second World War, that sort of thing. But what my piece is about is called Footloose. And it is a book uh, which has extensions. It's called a throw-up book. But the basis behind it is sort of an honor, in a way, to my husband. My husband worked for 17 years as a research chemist for Exxon and at the sign of the double cross. And in the end, when he retired from doing research chemistry for all these big places around here in New Jersey who make junk, uh, that's a minor word for it, he did start what was called <clears throat> damaged soil restoration. And my piece is about soil and about earth because all of the things that we have talked about today would never really have a basis except for the fact that we live on earth. It's that stuff down there that we walk on and is just so damaged. It's gonna be here Hopefully, maybe, when all of us are gone, and if we don't take care of it, if we really don't take care of it and get rid of all this stuff as much as we can, it's going to be there, and we're just going to be below it. 
if they have time to vary us. Otherwise, it's no good. Anyway, uh, the pictures in the book represent soil slices, which my husband took photographs of as he was uh, interested in what was going on with what's, what is going wrong with soil nowadays in our very, um, how shall I say, well, we're sort of like all urban uh, or suburban. And what's happening is we are putting up so many roofs, so many, and poisoning the soil with so many chemicals, but we have uh, roads and everything is just flattened. The soil is becoming totally compacted. So his idea was, what can we do, what can I do to, as a chemist, as with the learning that I have, to help seed in a small way? And he never got any money for this. He would give away stuff that he could patent as to how to help damaged soil. And it might be interesting also that I feel partially responsible, my name is on the patent as well as his, because the ideas, all of you people who do paper making, the ideas as to how to help damage soil come in a way out of paper making. We take a look at how the uh, basis of paper making and the reeds we use, which like cotton and flax and hemp and these different things which go into paper making, they also take the rain and it comes down through their branches and it goes into the soil. That's before you get to the nasty business of it being so compacted. Anyway, his idea was simply to take that business below, to fix the soil. And so what he did finally was to dig large trenches and put in them salt hay bales and the air that was trapped in with the salt hay bales, just like it's trapped in the fibers when we do paper making. You think about you, your paper making, how the uh, fibers of paper making are split apart and they have air in them. And then we work them and we put them into all of the paper that we make. But in any event, through the salt hay, the, the water takes the air and you must when you're doing this, trying to keep your soil uh, wet and to make the air go down in so that the soil is no longer compacted, mm -hmm. so that you can use the soil as it originally was used in the Amazon Terra Preta. You take the air, it goes down, it airifies, pushes that air, across and down as far as it can go. I, he said to me once, he said, well, how am I gonna get it down far enough? And I said, love, what you gotta do is you gotta make a barrier for the top 20 inches so that it'll go down to the t bottom 48 inches. It'll go down as the rain goes down and it can't escape sideways or be drawn in through the soil. It'll go down to that soil is then uh, no longer compacted below that. So the piece itself shows slices of soil. It also shows little pieces of handmade paper, mine, but it's, uh, and then it also shows, because my husband always loved birds, it shows feathers. And also, if the soil in the earth goes, it's not only us that's gonna go, it's gonna be everything else. It's gonna be those other creatures which are not human, but which are as important, and including birds. And that really is what it's about. And I will say the, the prints there are his feet, because as man, tr man trots around, he makes chemistry, he makes urban places, but he doesn't really think about the earth that he is destroying. Um, there was a book written once long ago, it was called No Braid of Grass, and it ended us as a civilization because nothing can feed and supply us with food, and we can't grow agricultural crops either if there is no grass. But the grass won't grow if the soil is not there to support it. So the idea is 
If the foot is too loose, it's called foot loose. If the foot is too loose and stamping down on this earth, then we're going to lose it all and it's going to end us all. And we can have as many wars about it as we wish. It's still, it's going to be all of us, not us all who go to war. We're all in a war to save the earth. Okay, I want Brian McCormick to speak about his pieces, please. Okay. Um, this is my piece here. It's it's a uh, rocket. It was a MA M twenty eight A two three point five rocket bazooka. Um, back in the nineties, I did graphics for a engineering firm that did uh, environmental reclamation. Um, a lot of what they did was exactly what everybody here is talking about: is cleanups of super fun sites. Um, what was happening at the time was there were a lot of army base closings and one of the things that the environmental firm got the contract for was to dig up and uh, dispense with unexploded ordnance and a lot of the property that you know people would actually They'd be walking out in a field and step on a mine and get blown up. So that was part of the uh, um, the re relationship to the you know the pollution of the ground. But one uh, particular project that stuck out in my mind um, was uh, the one an ongoing test site in Alaska that the, our, the company was sending people up to do. And it was, the name of the project was called Project Chariot. Um, someone in the military got the mind fart to, let's um, see if we can get rid of atomic waste. And they spread it out on the frozen tundra uh, up in Alaska within so many miles of indigenous people living in the area. And they figured that, oh, when, when the, the ice, you know, when the tundra starts to melt in the summertime, the water will wash the nuclear waste away. And, but that didn't, doesn't happen because the tundra, at least at that time, now it's melting. But at that time, it stays frozen pretty much all year round. And the water just kind of washed into the streams and then the people living along the coastline that received the water were getting high incidences of um, you know, leukemia. And of course the company, the, the U.S. Army, the people that, that had this project going, they of course, oh, that, that's not, you know, that's not our doing, you know. But so they had to constantly go up to Alaska and do radioactive tests for to see, uh, you know, they would actually have to cart the, the material away or whatever, to do whatever they had to do with it properly rather than, um, you know, rather than, than uh, just leaving it there. Um, so that was part of their contract. The other one was someone got the bright idea that they were going to make a dirty bomb. And they exploded uh, uh, atomic waste in a bomb and spread it out all over the desert. So that was one of the other projects that that the that uh, IT corporation had to send people to to um, uh, to clean up. So uh, it, actually, there to, to this date, there's probably you can't go one mile in any town without fun in in New Jersey without finding a super fun site. Um, I think there's like 2,000 of them, uh, last count, or somewhere around there. So that, that's why I created the uh, pieces that, that I did, and I wanted to speak about it today. So awesome. thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for all of you who are still standing, <laughs> thank you for coming. And uh, enjoy yourself, eat some more snacks. If you 
want to talk to other artists, there's one here, there's one there, I'm one. Uh, for all of you who we didn't get around to, Joan is one. Um, so thank you for coming here and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Anybody here?